From the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska, this is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. What would you do for love? What if someone stands between you and your heart's desire? And the person in the middle is your true love's estranged spouse. What if the woman you love and her spouse try to rekindle the flames of their damaged marriage, and you must think of them together? Would you accept defeat and quietly walk away? Or would you take a more proactive approach? Jim Wheeler decided the best path to his true love's heart was to blow up her husband's truck with her husband in it. Welcome to Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I'm your host, Robin Bearfield, and I'm broadcasting to you from the heart of the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge on Kodiak Island in Alaska. The town of Wasilla, Alaska sits 43 miles northeast of Anchorage, hugging the northern point of Cook Inlet and nestled in the matanuska susitna Valley in the south-central part of the state. Today, nearly 11,000 people live in Wasilla, but in 1993, the population was less than 5,000. On October 18, 1993, a bomb exploded in Robert Hank Dawson's pickup moments after he entered the gates of the Alcantara Armory in Wasilla, where he worked. Dawson, a 50-year-old National Guardsman, died instantly from the blast. The Alaska State Troopers, the FBI, and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms quickly began investigating the explosion, and they soon discovered remnants of a bomb and a radio receiver in Dawson's demolished truck. Authorities knew someone planted a bomb in Hank Dawson's truck and then detonated it with a remote-controlled device when Dawson drove to the gates of the armory. Who hated Dawson enough to obliterate him with a bomb? Calls soon flooded trooper headquarters, suggesting authorities put James Wheeler at the top of their suspect list. James Wheeler, 62, moved to Alaska in 1952 while in the Air Force. In 1956, he began serving as a law enforcement officer in the Alaska Territorial Guard. His original role in the Guard was to enforce fish and game regulations during the era before Alaska became a state. Wheeler retired from the Guard in 1972, and after working as a security guard for a few years, he became an expediter for the Anchorage Street Department. Esther, his wife, worked as a secretary at Elmendorf Air Force Base, and the couple lived near Cheney Lake in Anchorage until they retired in 1988. Wheeler's son, Gary, became an investigator with the Alaska State Troopers. Once Esther and Jim retired, Esther insisted on moving south to Squim, Washington. Soon after the move to Squim, Esther learned she had cancer, and she died two years later. Esther's death hit Jim hard, and he decided to move back to Alaska, where he would be closer to his son. He bought a house in Wasilla on Goldendale Drive, and his neighbors across the street were Hank Dawson and his eighth wife, 30-year-old Terry. According to neighbors, Wheeler became good friends with the Dawsons and was a frequent dinner guest at their house. Hank and Terry Dawson suffered marital problems in the summer of 1993, and Hank temporarily moved out of the house to live in Anchorage. After Hank walked out on her, Terry immediately called her neighbor, Jim Wheeler, to cry on his shoulder. Perhaps Terry considered her relationship with Jim platonic, But friends say Jim fell hard for Terry, 
Jim apparently could not keep his emotions to himself because he told anyone who would listen that he was in love with Terry Dawson. Meanwhile, Terry and Hank decided to work on their marriage, and Hank moved back into their Wasilla home over the 1993 Labor Day weekend. By this time, Jim Wheeler's feelings for Terry had grown into an obsession, and he told several people that he could not stand to think of Terry and Hank in bed together. Hank died in the explosion only four weeks after returning to live with Terry in Wasilla. When the troopers listened to accounts of Wheeler's obsession with Terry Dawson, they believed they had a viable suspect for the murder of Hank Dawson. Investigators convinced one of Jim's friends to call Wheeler and record their conversation. They hoped Wheeler would incriminate himself during the call, and they were not disappointed. While talking to his friend, Wheeler admitted he paid someone to kill Hank Dawson. He said he was in love with Terry and could not stand to think of her in bed with her husband. However, Dawson refused to tell the friend the name of the individual who planted and detonated the bomb. On November 9, 1993, troopers arrested James Wheeler as he ate lunch at the Windbreak Cafe in Wasilla. Wheeler hired John Murtaugh, a highly regarded defense attorney, and said nothing to investigators. At first, troopers didn't know if they should believe Wheeler's claim that he hired someone to murder Dawson. Was he telling the truth, or was he trying to pin Dawson's murder on someone else? Authorities strung crime scene tape around Wheeler's house and began combing through everything in the residence. And soon, a possible suspect emerged as someone who might, for the right price, build and explode a bomb. Jim Wheeler's former mining buddy, Ronald Geiger, had extensive experience with explosives. And according to acquaintances, he needed money. One man stepped forward to say he saw Geiger make a large purchase with $100 bills the day after the explosion. Ten days after the murder of Hank Dawson, Geiger left Alaska and moved to Everett, Washington. Troopers wanted to collect more evidence against Geiger before they questioned him. Geiger had few friends in Wasilla, and those who knew him described him as an unlikable character. Up until recently, though, he'd lived with his girlfriend, Faye Bedal. Faye also left Alaska soon after the explosion, and troopers located her in California and flew there to question her. According to Geiger's former girlfriend, Wilma Faye Bedal, during October 1993, Geiger worked for a man he referred to only as Jim. Bedal didn't know Jim's last name, and she said Geiger would not tell her what he was doing for Jim. Geiger never used his home phone to contact Jim. Anytime he wanted to talk to him, he left the house and used a payphone. When troopers asked Bedal if Geiger mentioned any details about Jim, she said Geiger told her Jim was a widower with a blind poodle. The investigators knew Jim Wheeler owned a nearly blind poodle. Bedal also said that Geiger, who never seemed to have money, suddenly had wads of $100 bills. Although circumstantial evidence was mounting against Ronald Geiger as the hitman, the troopers knew they needed a confession from Geiger to build a solid case against him. In early March 1994, Washington police arrested Ronald Earl Geiger, 58, and incarcerated him in the Snohomish County Jail in Everett, Washington. Alaska state troopers flew to Washington to question Geiger. Under interrogation, Geiger admitted that Jim Wheeler paid him $15,000 to build a bomb, place it in Dawson's pickup, and ignite it remotely with a radio-controlled device. Let me pause a moment 
to thank the brilliant folks at the puzzle game app Best Fiends for sponsoring Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I appreciate your support. I enjoy our summer-fall tourism season, but we put in long hours and I get very tired. We began our season this year by working 45 days straight with only a one-day break toward the beginning of the stretch. We finally have a few days off now before our last two weeks. When I get home after a long day on the boat, I have to process the fish our anglers caught. By the time I finish that chore, I am dead tired. But before I fall asleep, I spend a few moments with my best fiends. With my tired brain, I can't say I'm moving through the levels very quickly right now, but playing the game relaxes me, and my cheerful, funny fiends make me smile before I close my eyes. If you haven't tried Best Fiends yet, I highly recommend it. It's a bright, colorful puzzle game. At first glance, it appears simple, but the game is quite challenging. Since we have limited internet, I play the game offline, but you can also play online for a more interactive experience. Best Fiends is a great way to relax and re-energize. Give it a try. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Papers filed in the Palmer District Court charged Geiger with first-degree murder in the killing of Hank Dawson. Still, despite his confession to the Alaska State Troopers who questioned him in Washington, Ron Geiger pleaded not guilty. Terry Dawson, Hank's widow and the central figure in this tangled web, filed a civil suit against Hank Dawson, seeking $1.6 million from him to compensate her and her young son for their loss. She said, Wheeler has caused us incalculable grief and suffering to satisfy his warped desires. She claimed Wheeler developed an obsessive romantic fixation on her, while she only considered him a friend. She said she did not have sexual relations with Hank Dawson, but Dawson's lawyer, John Murtaugh, said Terry was lying. According to Murtaugh, Terry Dawson told law enforcement officers that there was a sexual relationship between her and Mr. Wheeler, and she said things got steamy several times. Terry Dawson finally admitted in court that she and Wheeler had sexual contact on four occasions but she said it was limited to fondling. Wheeler insisted they had sexual intercourse. Regardless of how Terry regarded her relationship with Wheeler, Jim Wheeler fell in love with Terry Dawson and could not stand the thought of her with someone else. Wheeler said Terry reminded him of his late wife, and when Hank moved out of the house, Wheeler helped Terry with chores and often invited her over for dinner. When Wheeler took a quick trip to Seattle, Terry accompanied him. Neighbors said Terry and Wheeler became constant companions during the summer of 1993. In October 1994, James Wheeler went on trial for the murder of Hank Dawson, and Wheeler testified in his defense for nearly four hours. He did not deny his feelings for Terry Dawson, but he said he did not murder her husband. Wheeler said he had no reason to kill Dawson because he knew Hank would eventually leave Terry. Hank Dawson had already divorced seven previous wives, and Wheeler said he believed it was only a matter of time before he divorced Terry. According to Wheeler, Hank told him numerous times that he could care less about Terry and had no use for sex with her. Wheeler said Terry also confided in him about her troubled marriage, and the night Hank moved out of their house, Terry called Wheeler in tears. Wheeler said his intimate relationship with Terry began the following day, 
and the affair lasted until Labor Day weekend when Hank moved home. When District Attorney Ken Goldman asked Wheeler if he would like to get back together with Terry, Wheeler said, if she will have anything to do with me, yes. Terry's civil lawsuit against him apparently did not diminish Wheeler's feelings for her. The jury deliberated for only two hours before finding James Wheeler guilty of first-degree murder. The court sentenced him to 99 years in prison. The road to justice for Ron Geiger, the man who built, planted, and exploded the bomb, proved rocky. The state of Alaska initially charged Geiger with the first-degree murder of Hank Dawson. When Alaska state troopers interviewed Geiger at the Snohomish County Jail in Everett, Washington, he confessed to planting and igniting the bomb that killed Hank Dawson. Still, he later pleaded not guilty to the crime. Unfortunately, Superior Court Judge Beverly Cutler threw out Geiger's confession because the troopers did not tape the first 95 minutes of the original two and one half hour interview with him when he confessed to the crime. According to Alaska law, officers must tape record interrogations of people in police custody. But as long as the incarcerated individual knows he is talking to a police officer, the officer does not need to tell him he is being recorded. The law differs in Washington state. In Washington, police must ask the suspect's permission to record. District Attorney Ken Goldman said the troopers were afraid Geiger would refuse to talk if he knew they were recording him. So they followed Washington law and did not tape him for the first hour and a half of his interview. They then turned on the tape recorder for the remainder of their interrogation. Judge Cutler said there was nothing she could do. Since the troopers did not tape the entire interview with Ronald Geiger, she had no choice but to rule his confession inadmissible in court. Goldman knew the state's case against Ronald Geiger rested on shaky ground without the interview. Without Geiger's confession, Goldman only had circumstantial evidence, including Geiger's former girlfriend's testimony. Faye Bedell not only claimed Geiger worked with a man named Jim on a secretive project, but she said she heard Geiger on the telephone discussing explosives with Jim. Goldman also had the testimony of the man who saw Geiger make a large purchase with $100 bills the day after the explosion. These scattered pieces of information meant little, though, without Geiger's confession. Let me take another short break. Like most of you, I am always looking for new mystery podcasts to listen to. And I recently came across Resolved Mysteries. It's a fascinating, well-researched show. Listen to the trailer and give it a try. Hi, we're Eliza, Allison, and Carlin, and we're the hosts of Resolved Mysteries Podcast. Our podcast follows the 80s and 90s television show Unsolved Mysteries, hosted by Robert Stack. We have a love for true crime and the unsolved. If you don't remember Unsolved Mysteries, we forgive you, but you don't have to know to get into our show. If you like true crime stuff, ghost stuff, alien stuff, or just stories about weird shit like Bigfoot, this is your podcast. The stories we cover range from totally ridiculous to truly heartbreaking. We do detailed research on all of the segments that Unsolved Mysteries aired, then drink some wine and give you the latest updates on every case. We talk about stories that will leave you laughing, crying, and occasionally outraged. Resolve Mysteries podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your favorite pods. Join us and perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. After the Alaska Supreme Court refused to review Judge Cutler's decision concerning the admissibility of Geiger's confession, Goldman contacted federal prosecutors and asked them to take a look at the murder case against Ronald Geiger. 
Federal law does not require officers to tape the entire interrogation of a suspect, so Geiger's confession would be admissible in federal court. Because Hank Dawson leased the truck destroyed by the bomb, Ford Motor Company, not Hank Dawson, owned the pickup, and an out-of-state company insured it. The federal prosecutor maintained that the truck's destruction affected interstate commerce, making this a federal crime. According to federal law, whoever maliciously destroys or damages or attempts to damage or destroy by means of fire or explosive any building, vehicle, or any other real or personal property used in interstate or foreign commerce or in any activity affecting interstate commerce, and if death results to any person, the perpetrator shall be subject to imprisonment for any term of years or to the death penalty or to life imprisonment. In other words, if Hank Dawson had owned the truck destroyed by the bomb, the U.S. federal government would have had no jurisdiction in this case. Since he leased and insured the vehicle from out-of-state companies, its destruction affected interstate commerce, allowing the federal government to bring a lawsuit against Ron Geiger. U.S. Attorney Robert Bundy charged Ron Geiger with five felony counts in connection with the death of Hank Dawson. These included illegally making a bomb, possessing a bomb, and using a bomb to commit a violent crime. The court also charged Geiger with maliciously destroying Dawson's truck and affecting interstate commerce. Ronald Geiger was convicted in federal court of malicious destruction of a vehicle used in and affecting interstate commerce using and carrying a firearm connected with the crime of violence, and possession of a destructive device. The judge sentenced him to life imprisonment, plus a term of 30 years. Geiger appealed the verdict and questioned the federal court's jurisdiction, but the appeals court did not overturn his conviction. While Jim Wheeler and Ron Geiger carefully plotted their plan to murder Hank Dawson, did they not see they would quickly emerge as the crime's logical perpetrators? What happened in Wasilla in 1993 to cause Jim Wheeler, who up until then was a law-abiding citizen, to hire a hitman to kill his neighbor? James Wheeler would tell you he murdered for love but I beg to differ. Three of the oldest and most common criminal motives spawn the murder of Hank Dawson. Sex, jealousy, and greed. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you to my patrons for your support. Check out the show notes for more information on how you can support this podcast and unlock extra episodes by joining the Last Frontier Club. You can also search for this podcast on Patreon to learn more about the Last Frontier Club. I'll see you soon for the next episode of Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. Mm-hmm.